Hello, hello, and welcome to the Japan Zoomina at UC San Diego. Today is March 22nd, and our topic is Shibusawa Eiji's legacy and Japan's new form of capitalism. Today's event is co-sponsored by the government of Japan. While the participants are uh, still finding their Zoom seats, let me give you a few notes of background on the Japan Zoomina. My name is Ulrika Shader. I'm a professor of Japanese business at UC San Diego and the director of JFIT, the Japan Forum for Innovation and Technology. We are at GPS, the School of Global Policy and Strategy. GPS is an international relations and public policy school that offers uh, among uh, various other degrees, a master's of international affairs with a Japan specialization. If you're interested in our offerings, please go to gps.ucsd.edu. And at GPS, we have JFIT, uh, our Japan activity center here on campus, and you can find us under jfit.ucsd.edu. And if you go there, you can see a number of tabs. One is titled News and Media, where you can sign up for our JFIT San Diego Japan Newsflash, which is just a little newsletter where we try to have some fun with uh, non-standard news from Japan and San Diego. And right next to it is the Japan Zoominar tab, where we have uh, sign-in information for upcoming events, as well as recorded past events. And yes, our Zoominars are recorded. So uh, you can go to the JC Gallery and uh, pick one of these four categories. And if you do that, it'll look like this. And then you click that button and you'll find the recording. What that means is that as you ask a question, uh, you'll type your question into the Q&A later on today. Uh, if I read out your question, I will refer to you only by your first name to uh, protect your privacy. So our Zooming now is a regular thing. Uh, now that it's daylight saving times here in San Diego, uh, it's 8 a.m. on Wednesdays, every other Wednesday in Japan. And we have upcoming uh, Professor Hilary Holbro uh, going to talk with us about changing employment norms and women in Japan's workforce, followed by Dr. Sheila Smith from the Council of Foreign Relations with the uh, interestingly titled event, Is Japan Ready for War? Putin's Invasion and the Taiwan Contingency. And then we'll have uh, Suzu Kan, uh, Hiroshi Suzuki, who uh, used to be the vice minister of MEXT uh, in charge of education and will discuss Japan's education system. And this will keep going, so stay tuned. Uh, alrighty, so with that, uh, let me turn to uh, our, our guests today. I'll turn my PowerPoints off to introduce them. There they are, Dr. Robert Feltman and Professor Patty McLachlan. Uh, so let me introduce you, Patty, uh, first. Uh, Professor Patricia McLachlan is Professor of Government and Asian Studies and the Mitsubishi Heavy Industry Professor of Japanese Studies at the Department of Government. Boy, that's a mouthful, Patty. At the Department of Government at the University of Texas in Austin. She uh, originally hails from Canada and well, she earned her BA and MA degrees and holds a PhD in political science uh, from Columbia University and where she studied with Jerry Curtis. Uh, so she's gonna be the political scientists on our uh, panel today. She has written many books, including on consumers in Japan, the post office and its uh, various functions, as well as very recently, fresh, hot from the press, a book uh, called Betting on the Farm, uh, on Japanese agriculture changes. And uh, with Patty and me today is Robbie Feldman. And you really don't need an introduction, Robbie, but I have to be complete, so allow me. Uh, so Robert Feldman is a senior advisor at Morgan Stanley MUFG uh, Securities, uh, where he for many years has headed the research department uh, and uh, is also a professor at the Tokyo University of Science, where he teaches uh, management of technology program. Uh, he uh, really needs no introduction because I think, Robbie, nobody has won more awards uh, uh, as a chief economist and a Wall Street player in, in, in Japan than, than you have over the years. Uh, he's been the, the ranked chief economist uh, and best economist many years uh, before he was at Morgan, uh, Morgan Stanley. He was at uh, Salomon Brothers. He was at 
uh, IMF. And before that, at some point uh, in your career, you were at the Bank of Japan where we met uh, uh, in the early 80s. Um, uh, just after you'd earned your PhD in economics from MIT. And so our plan today is as follows. So we have uh, three disciplines here. Uh, so I'm the business economist, then uh, Robbie is the economist and, and Patty is the political scientist. And what we wanna do today is talk about Shibusawa Eiji, uh, and I will introduce who that was, and how that's connected to Prime Minister Kishida's new form of capitalism concept. So uh, it's a little bit weird that I would go first, but, but such it is. Uh, I have street cred on uh, Shibusawa Eiji because I actually graduated from Shitatsubashi University of which I will say more in just a minute. So I'm going back to my PowerPoints. You've already seen this. So um, there are uh, lots of books on Shibusawa aging. In fact, there's currently just a boom. So for instance, this one is by Shimada Masakazu, who uh, has written a book on, on, on the sort of the whole life, where did he come from and how did this all happen? But there are many more. Uh, I like the title of this one, Ethical Capitalism, uh, which is a, a, histor a historian's account. Um, then there is sort of the father of Japanese capitalism. Then, of course, Shibusawa's own books, The Analect and uh, The Abacus, so uh, Confucian Capitalism, uh, Business Ethics. Uh, somebody wrote a book about him with the title Confucian Capitalism, uh, the first industrialist of Japan. Uh, there is an autobiography that Teruko Craig has uh, translated. Uh, something about his foreign policy, of which more in a second as well, and uh, a, a great book, uh, a, a paper by Johannes Hirschmeier and a Lockbook, Lockwood reader. So you could knock yourself out. If that's too much, there is also the, uh, the uh, Maru Wakari, which I think we would call Shibusawa Eichi for dummies. Uh, why is this man on the new 10,000 yen note? All right, so let me explain. So this is the, what the note is going to look like. It'll be uh, issued in 2024. And uh, so Shibusawa Eiji lived from 1840 to 1931. He was the son of a very smart and uh, wealthy Saitama indigo trader farmer. He then flipped flop a little bit. As first, he joined the Son no Joey team. Then he somehow founded himself as a loyal retainer to the last Tokugawa shogun, Shitatsubashi Yoshinobu, uh, who sent him with uh, uh, his would have been successor uh, had there been another shogun uh, to Europe, where he spent the tumultuous uh, Meiji uh, uh, restoration from abroad. And he came back from Europe with four big impressions. The first was that trains were absolutely important for a developed uh, in, industrial nation. And so he uh, came back and he founded more than 16 train companies by the time he was done. He then realized that banks were absolutely important to create uh, a, a, uh, a vibrant economy. And that uh, third, the joint stock company was a superior form of organizing this because it would spread the wealth and it would bring in money from various parts and then distribute money from various parts. And, for, and last but not the least, he was also impressed with uh, the poverty he saw on the way, including beginning in Shanghai and then uh, various steps in Europe uh, and that left a mark on him. Uh, as he returned, he joined the Ministry of Finance uh, where he was colleagues with Ito Hirobumi uh, as well as uh, Okuma and Inoue, uh, all main figures of the Meiji Restoration, of course. Um, he then said, oh, government is not for me, and somehow got uh, pulled in by um, uh, his friend Masuda, who was at Mitsui at the time, to bail out their attempt at building a bank. And that thing became the first national bank, which today is Mizuho. So he kind of turned that around and then found it. Uh, he was a clever guy, he realized that he had a bank, but nobody to lend to. So he founded some 200 companies, uh, plus some 200 nonprofits, including on the nonprofit side, the Japan Red Cross, Tokyo Yo Ikuin, the first welfare organization, the Japanese Chamber of Commerce to represent small firms. Um, my 
College of Commerce, which I'll talk about in a moment, and the Takuzen Kai were Choose the Good Association, which was the a precursor of the uh, Association of Bankers Association, so the Banks Bank uh, Kai. All right, so um, he probably he barely didn't need a lot of, of sleep. But let me just say a thing on, on, on Tatsubashi. So uh, this is the logo of Tatsubashi and it's the CC is not a doctor thing. It, it stands for uh, uh, College of Commerce. And um, our uh, our uh, motto is Captains of Industry. I actually have the uh, the t-shirt to show. I am uh, Captain of Industry by virtue of having graduate, graduated there and taught there. Uh, Tatsubashi was founded as the anti-todai as the anti-University of Tokyo, because uh, Shibusawa thought that if Japan wanted to have a vibrant economy, someone had to train not bureaucrats and politicians, but business people. So he was early on into, the, uh, into, into that. Here's a list of companies he founded. I mentioned the railways, the banks, uh, steamship, paper, uh, fertilizer, Tokyo Gas, Tokyo Marine. Uh, Ishikawajima Shipyard, Sapporo Breweries, the Bank of Japan, the Imperial Hotel, all of these. He started as a banker and then uh, made them join stock companies so other people got rich. Uh, I would like to think of him as a private equity investor, actually, uh, because he had a stable of young people that he groomed and sent abroad for study and then sent them to become um, uh, uh, the CEOs, and then he he lent money to them, and sometimes invested, based on personal security, what he called. Uh, and uh, he resented monopolies, and and uh, later in life became very much anti-government. He believed in market competition and private enterprise. Um, and so uh, one of the things that's interesting about Shibusawa, he didn't really get rich. Well, uh, well, he was only the 18th wealthiest man in Japan, as opposed to the Zaibatsu people, uh, including, of course, uh, the Iwasaki family, which was by far the richest at the time. And the reason that he saw himself as not getting rich as a good thing was that he thought that in the early Meiji period, the main thing that had to happen for Japan to really become an industrialized nation was to get over the Shino Kosho uh, uh, system of, of, oops, of the Tokugawa period. Uh, the merchants had no social standing in the Tokugawa years. And in order to um, kind of get them up in status, uh, he wanted to educate them and have these joint stock companies and make sure that, 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 they would, uh, that, that, that the wealth would be spread. He was really not in, on good terms with Iwasaki. Uh, this is Iwasaki Ataru, the Mitsubishi uh, Zaibatsu founder, who uh, he felt was just too rich <laughs> and not spending it enough. And so the, the, the phrase that he is usually associated with is gappon shugi, which refers not only to the joint stock company system, but this idea of combining capital to create economic value, value and then joint wealth creation. And so basically his teaching was about a bushido for merchants, uh, justice, integrity, you know, all of these things that we know from the whole, from the old samurai spirit. And, he, and remember that he was a samurai early in life. He applied to Western capitalism. Okay, so I want to end on, uh, and so the idea is to make capitalism good all. I want to end with one observation, and that is that we should maybe not get too excited about this. If we put it in the context of the time, what I have here is on the upper left hand is uh, Andrew Carnegie, J.D. Rockefeller, because Robbie is here, I put J.P. Morgan on there as well. Uh, then we have uh, Werner Siemens and Alfred Krupp in Germany. We have George Cadbury, the chocolate guy, and William Lever, Unilever in the UK. And they were all sort of it, at that time doing similar things. And let us also remember that Max Weber was writing the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism at roughly that time. And there's actually a story about how Shibu Saba called JD Rockefeller and said, keeping all that money is not cool. You need to distribute it more. And whether that's true or not, we don't know. But uh, one of the books speaks to the fact that six years later, the Rockefeller Foundation was funded. OK, so how has this developed from these old guys, right? And so the United States, of course, now has a lot of philanthropy, but also short-termism and a whole lot of financialization. Uh, the 
Europe is more on the taxation side for income redistribution. And the big question that we want to answer today or ask today is, what if people like Shibusawa and Masuda and the sort of the, the Confucian capitalism, what, what is next from there, right? Um, because Japan has had these long-term business relations and spreading the wealth, but, um, but we don't really know what that's gonna look like going forward. And that's our topic. And it is a big topic. And it's a big topic in the United States, corporate social responsibility, uh, what can governments do uh, if capitalism is hurting, which it is uh, in, in the US. And uh, Shibusawa san would have told us, yes, absolutely, governments make rules and corporate ethics can be a component of those rules. So let me stop there uh, with my little Shibusawa thing. Uh, uh, that was a lot, uh, but I was limited to 10 minutes. So I think I barely made it, so uh, 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 thank you. And, and so now let's, let's seg into the present tense. And, and Robbie, um, you've studied uh, the writings that, that, as far as they exist to this point uh, on uh, Prime Minister Kishida's new form of capitalism. So can you explain to us what that's all about? Hey, thanks very much, uh, Ulrika. Uh, and thanks for having me on uh, today. Um, uh, there was an essay that uh, Prime Minister Kishida published in the February issue uh, of Bungei Shinju, the Japanese magazine, uh, where he uh, took a number of uh, major steps toward clarifying exactly what he wants to get at uh, in uh, this uh, uh, new form of capitalism. He referred, of course, to Shibusawa many times uh, in the essay. Uh, and in addition, he uh, went back even further in Japanese traditions and talked about the Omi merchants uh, using the, their phrase uh, called triple win uh, uh, capitalism, that is to say good for the buyer, good for the seller, and good for society. And one of the stories from then is uh, that an Omi merchant wanted to go from point A to point B, but there was no bridge across the river. He had to go way, way around, go way upstream, cross somewhere else, come down. It was a pain in the neck. So he said, okay, I'm just going to use my money and I'm going to build a bridge. So he built a bridge, helped himself, helped the community and his own business did very, very well because he was thinking uh, about uh, society as well as his own business. So that's where the, the term triple win uh, comes from. Uh, and uh, Prime Minister Kishida uses this in a number of places. He still himself calls it the new form of capitalism. But we have to update this for what's going on now. So if I may, I'd like to share one slide uh, that uh, shows uh, what um, uh, he's, he's getting at here, okay? And if I may just make this big, is that getting up to where it needs to be? There we are, okay. Um, on October 8th of last year, uh, Prime Minister Kishida gave his first policy speech in the Diet. And when he talked about his growth strategy, he said, uh, number one main street uh, in my growth strategy uh, is making Japan a nation founded on science and technology. Kagaka Gijitsurikoku is the Japanese a phrase for that. So I start uh, this uh, slide explaining a uh, triple in capitalism with technology. That's number one on the left-hand side there. Uh, the next element uh, is investments, taking this top technology and turning it into physical, human, particularly human capital, intellectual capital, and infrastructure capital. Now, where are these things used? Uh, they're after that in two tracks. Uh, number three up there is what I call the security track. Uh, there's sustainability and there's resilience. Resilience is for the short-term things like uh, flood uh, control, uh, backup uh, power. We're having a bit of a power problem in Tokyo right now because of unsustainably cold weather. Uh, do we have enough backup capacity to keep people warm? Uh, so that's the short-term part. But then there's also the sustainability. Uh, and Prime Minister Kishi has recommitted to uh, Prime Minister Suga's uh, long-term goals on uh, 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 reducing climate change, et cetera. Those two things will lead to economic security and there's now a minister for economic security. So that's the, called the security track uh, that is supposed to be addressed by these investments. In addition, at the bottom, I have the prosperity track. The same investments uh, are aimed at raising productivity. 
Uh, and it's not uh, just redistributing uh, wealth uh, or redistributing uh, the fruits of activity between capital and labor. Uh, that is not what he has in mind, and he's quite explicit on that. What he says is that he wants uh, to um, use redistribution as a tool to raise both wages and profits. Well, how do you do that? Well, that's the wonder of technology. It's a win-win um, uh, activity. Uh, and what he says is he wants to tilt the gains from all this wonderful new technology toward wages, even while profits still go up. And in particular, we now have a prime minister who's criticizing Japanese business for low profitability rates. Uh, he says very explicitly that he wants to raise the operating profit margins of Japanese companies. And uh, with all this new technology, more goes to wages, but some goes to profits as well. He regards this as an improvement in the fairness of the economy. Japan does have a very serious poverty problem. Uh, and with that fairness uh, improvement comes a better middle class, stronger uh, incomes for young people in particular, uh, which will raise uh, prosperity. Put the fairness prosperity together with economic security and you get his ultimate goal, which is social unity. So this is the structure of thought uh, that he has behind uh, his um, uh, triple win uh, capitalism or what he calls new form of capitalism. So that's all uh, a very interesting. Um, he uh, is quite uh, clear uh, that there are a number of call it elements in this uh, that people need to understand a little bit better uh, than they have so far. Uh, so one of the things, and this is particularly un, you know, tragically relevant now with what's going on in the Ukraine, uh, is that he views this recreation of capitalism as the way that the combination of market capitalism and democracy uh, can prove itself superior uh, to the combination of uh, state capitalism and authoritarianism. And he is very explicit about this in the very first part of the essay. So I thought that's quite interesting, uh, unfortunately and tragically more interesting now than it was when he wrote the essay. But he also uh, talks a lot about basic economic principles, uh, about uh, how, um, the uh, uh, triple win capitalism will correct uh, negative economic externalities uh, and uh, negative market failures uh, and maximize the benefits of capitalism. Uh, so there's a lot in there defining what he means uh, in very standard, uh, very respectable uh, economics. So that's all great. Uh, then the question comes, okay, all sounds good. Um, who pays? What are the other ambiguities in this? And there are a number of them. Uh, they're not insurmountable, but they're uh, formidable. Uh, as I mentioned just now, who pays? It's a big question. Um, these investments are gonna take a lot of money. We don't know how much. Uh, is the Bank of Japan gonna print the money? Are we gonna raise taxes? Uh, or are we gonna cut spending in some other places in order to fund uh, spending for new initiatives? Uh, Japan now spends about two thirds of all government spending on social programs. Uh, education has been flat as a pancake for 20 years. R&D has been flat as a pancake for 20 years in nominal terms. Okay. So are we going to allocate some monies from that huge increase in social spending, pensions, medical, et cetera, and bring improve efficiency in those areas and bring that money back to other uses? So that's the first major question. There's no timeline uh, in or clear timeline in uh, the essay. What do we do when? Um, there are issues of retraining and education. How are we gonna re-educate so many people? In the essay, the Prime Minister Kishida talks about uh, a fund uh, that will re-educate a million workers, including part-timers. That's great. But according to uh, the uh, calculations by um, in a McKinsey report, I've done similar ones, Japan will probably need to retrain about uh, 10, 11 million people, not just one. So how's that gonna happen? Um, there's a lot of talk in the essay about uh, market failures. There's not a lot of talk about government failures. Um, and so we need some uh, attention uh, to this matter. Um, there's a wonderful book uh, by Diane Coyle, the economist at uh, Cambridge, uh, a book that she dedicates in part to her dog, Cabbage. Um, and that book uh, uh, includes a long chapter on the government failures, okay? as did uh, Professor Tatsu Hata in his microeconomics textbook. So we need a little more attention to exactly why those things happen uh, and how we can uh, improve national governments to, uh, to improve them, but we don't see much of that, uh, that in this plan. Um, one of the other things I think is extraordinarily important here, and we don't have a good answer, is how do you overcome resistance to innovation? There are a couple of wonderful books 
uh, one by uh, uh, Calestus Juma. Uh, unfortunately, he's passed away now, but he was a, a, a scholar at the Kennedy School. Uh, his book is called Innovation and Its Enemies. Uh, there's another one uh, from Mark Zachary uh, Taylor, a uh, scholar now at uh, Georgia Tech. Um, and his book uh, is called The Politics of Innovation. And basically putting these two books together, what you get is that whenever there is a new innovation, a new idea, the people who have founded their lives on the old technology will resist. Okay? For example, coffee coming into Europe. The uh, pubs hated it. The guys who sold alcohol didn't want the coffee shops coming in. And there were even fights in the streets in Vienna about this. Maria Teresa settled it by ordering uh, all those who um, uh, serve coffee to serve alcohol, all those who serve alcohol to serve coffee. Okay? So we need some way uh, to uh, spread the technology in a way that reduces the resistance. Okay? Uh, so I can recommend those two books, but we don't see much of that strategy uh, here in, uh, in uh, Prime Minister Kishida's essay. Um, there are a few other things. What do you do about dividends? What do you do about, uh, about uh, buybacks, things like that? But basically uh, it's a good plan, uh, but there are a lot of steps on the way to getting it done. Um, so what are the things uh, that we need to look for and what's the timeline on this? Uh, I think in terms of what we need to look for uh, are these two things. Can Prime Minister creation, uh, Kishida create a consensus that these are the right things to do? Okay. Is there a crisis in terms of microcycle crisis response, improvement, complacency? There's clearly a crisis going on globally, higher energy prices, higher uh, grain prices. These are all very detrimental to Japan. Um, so can he create the sense that new capitalism is the answer uh, to these and then uh, move uh, forward with it? So those are the issues I think that we're facing right now. Um, and uh, we'll see some things over the summer. Um, in terms of a few new reports. Uh, but unfortunately, things aren't really, I think, going to uh, get moving until after the upper house election. Uh, and presumably, if the LDP does well in that election, which I expect it to do, uh, then we'll have uh, three years where this program can be honed down, uh, focused, uh, sharpened, uh, and then uh, implemented. Um, so I hope that happens. Uh, but as uh, I think uh, President Reagan once said, trust, but verify. So let me pass it on to Patty. Well, thank you. Thank you, Robbie. Uh, we have some questions on the authors that you just mentioned. So maybe at the very end, if you could uh, give those names again, that would be great. Um, uh, Patty, uh, what does the political scientists have to say to all of this? Uh, lots of things, I think. And you can hear me well. All right, um, I'm gonna do two, uh, three things today, partly at your request, Ulrike, and I thank you for inviting me today. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I wanna start, first of all, saying a few words about the role of the state in shaping capitalism and where Japan fits in. Then I'm going to um, look at one component of the new form of capitalism and explore its significance, and that's the redistribution component, which tends to get a lot of attention from a political science perspective. And I'm going to make some comparisons between what Prime Minister Kishida's vision is and redistributive efforts from the past. Um, and along the way, I think I'll try and identify some of the challenges and the trade-offs that are involved in redistribution. Like Robbie, I think this is a very ambitious project um, and it uh, seeks to do a great number of things, um, but there are of course, zero sum games involved uh, in some of these efforts. And then I'm gonna end up with an, a bit of an indulgence in some speculation. If Shibusawa were alive today, what would he have to say about new capitalism? So that's how I'll end up. So first of all, turning to the role of the state in shaping capitalism or capitalist economic development. Rike, when you invited me to speak about this, I have to admit I was a little overwhelmed because this is a huge literature, lots of debates, um, and you know, lots of hetero, uh, heterodox thinking and then uh, revisionist thinking and everything in between. So there are many different ways in which states can guide markets, but I think for the sake of our purposes today, it would be helpful to revisit briefly Chalmers Johnson's topology of political economic mar models, how states and markets relate to one another. And he basically identified three broad clusters 
or models of political economy. And the first was, of course, the market rational approach, um, Anglo-American style capitalism, which privileges market forces and limits the state to a regulatory role. This was kind of a neoclassical economic perspective. At the opposite extreme, he identified plan ideological, Soviet style, socialist command economies in which private enterprise is all but eliminated, market forces suppressed, and the state performs the work of the market. And then in the middle, there was this new idea, the, plan, the concept of a plan rational developmental state in which private enterprise and market forces are prioritized but guided actively by state involvement in the affairs of industry and firms with an eye to the long-term betterment of all of society, not just firms. And of course, Johnson coined this term to describe what he perceived as the Japanese model during the 1960s. Now, of course, that model didn't always work well in practice. As Ravi has pointed out, the state made plenty of bad calls that enabled all manner of economic mischief, inefficiencies, and some will even say it contributed to Japan's long period of so-called economic stagnation. And other scholars have also pointed out since Johnson wrote this um, seminal book in 1982, Meeting in the Japanese Miracle, that developmentalism has also been accompanied by the systematic compensation of those left behind by economic growth. And that took the form of redistribution. So basically, while the government was trying to promote certain industries and firms, it was also transferring funds in a Robin Hood kind of way by taking from the rich, the salary men, and giving to the poor or those who risk becoming uh, left behind, particularly farmers and small business. And this was achieved largely through adjustments to tax policies. And I would say it was quite successful, probably contributed to the perception of fully 90% of the Japanese population that they belong to the middle class. So inequality under developmentalism really wasn't a problem, whether it had to do more with the policies of the developmental state or the fact that no matter what Japan did, it was on a growth trajectory and the pie was growing, um, that is of course open to debate. Now we know that over the last three to four decades, as the excesses and inefficiencies of state like capitalism have grown more and more apparent, the LDP has led efforts to shrink the size of government, to retreat from those many costly redistributive programs and embrace a more market rational or neoliberal economic reform agenda. Not quite going to the Anglo-American model, but certainly heading toward it. We saw it in the 1980s with Nakasone's privatization of large public enterprises, Hachimoto's deregulation of the financial sector in the 90s, Koizumi, of course, in the 20, uh, 20, early 2000s, tried to rid the state of some of its financial intermediation roles by privatizing postal savings and insurance. And then, of course, during the 19, 2010s, Abe Shinzo set out in the third era or structural reform component of Abenomics to um, increase productivity levels through structural reform. Now, I read and certainly Ravi has pointed out and Kishida has uh, um, uh, underscored this uh, element in his Bunge Shinju, Shinju um, uh, article that the new form of capitalism is I think fundamentally a response to the negative side effects of this market rational neoliberal uh, reform agenda that critics have long criticized as a form of market fundamentalism that wasn't sufficiently conscious to the negative side effects of, of rapid economic or economic growth by neoliberal programs. Um, in particular, he's very concerned about the exacerbation of inequality. That middle class has shrunk. It's no longer at 90%. It's a fraction of what it used to be. And there is also a growing gap between urban and especially rural Japan. So Prime Minister Kishida hopes to alleviate these problems by promoting a virtuous cycle involving a comprehensive mix of both growth policies and redistributive, redistributive policies. And redistribution, as I've read it, and I understand it, and I know this is still a work in progress, seems to have three pillars. And I wanna look at each one quickly in turn, and in so doing, emphasize some of the continuities and departures from redistribution during the rapid growth era under developmentalism, and then identify a few more of those challenges and trade-offs. Um, and pillar number one is, of course, wage increases. Um, 
Prime Minister Kishida would like to see wages increase by at least 3%. And I would argue that this policy is to the Kishida government, which what social transfers via tax policy were to governments under developmentalism. Now, many firms are hoarding cash and Kishida's aim is to incentivize them using corporate tax breaks to share some of that cash with employees. So it sounds great in principle, but like Robbie, I see many challenges. Um, I hope they achieve this, uh, but there are many things that I think the government of Japan will have to consider. Um, and one of them is that the Abe government has tried to do this in the past. Um, tried to secure wage increases through some corporate tax incentives, but they weren't very successful. And I'd really love to know um, what the government plans to do differently. At this point, I don't think it's very clear. Um, it's also clear that a lot of small companies don't have the extra cash on hand to channel into wage incentives. And many companies, large and small, are facing the specter of rising production costs resulting from COVID and the war in Ukraine. This may offset incentives to increase wages. And then finally, a question, what prevents some firms that introduce wage increases from lowering costs by lay uh, laying off uh, workers? Um, I'm, I think many political scientists and sociologists are worried that higher wages may entail a sacrifice of job security moving forward. And I think that raises it's a good segue into the second pillar as I see it, and that's government investment in human capital. And this is really new. This is, these are efforts to improve skills, train and retrain rec workers and the like. And in theory, it will contribute to a more mobile, competitive labor sector which economists view as essential to long-term growth. Um, and it's new in the sense that in the past, when there was lifetime employment, it was firms that carried out this task. Now government seems to be um, assuming a role. And again, I'd love, I'm looking forward to seeing how this is fleshed out. The government speaks of public-private partnerships in this regard, which I think is a good, good idea. But it does raise a question for me if labor does indeed become even more mobile and workers are less loyal to firms, what, will inse what incentives will firms have to invest their resources in these sorts of training, these sorts of training programs, particularly if the, it, it can't count on its workers um, to be loyal to, it, to those firms over the long term? And here I'm thinking about some of the work of Kathleen Thalen, who's done a lot of work on job training um, and retraining in Germany and the United States. And she pointed out that it's far more successful in Germany than it is in the United States, in part because of closer knit relations between workers and firms in Germany. Finally, I think the last pillar um, is um, uh, most obviously the creation of a more sustainable social safety net. This is a carryover from the past and by now, the objective is to reform social security systems in order to help revive the middle class and put those programs on more stable financial footing. But as Robbie asks, who's going to pay this? Who will pay for it? Increasing taxation is no longer viable. It will probably offset growth when um, the economic pie is no longer growing and deficit spending is also a problem when government debt is already at epic proportions. So returning to or getting to my last point, what would Shibusawa say if he were around to comment on new capitalism? And I'm being speculative. And I read some of the stuff that you put up um, early in your talk today, um, Urike. And on the basis of that, this is what I would say. So judging from his time as a bureaucrat in the Ministry of Finance and his later writings and lectures, we know that Shibusawa Eichi had a deep distrust of laissez-faire capitalism. He knows that markets can fail and can fail societies. So I think he would have agreed with the Prime Minister's critique of the growing overemphasis since the 1980s on firm profitability and the welfare of shareholders over the welfare of other stakeholders that's implicit in his concept of gapun shugi. We know also that he believed in the power of markets and the responsibility of private enterprise, particularly entrepreneurs, to contribute to a prosperous society. We know that he believed in the responsibility of government to create opportunities for private enterprise to prosper and to do well by society. That means getting the underlying institutions of the economy right. 
And finally, I suspect he would have supported a role, a limited role for government in limiting the impact of those negative externalities of market activities that can be harmful to the broader uh, welfare of society. But we also know that he was an avowed foe of Japanese bureaucracy and elites, not least because of its capacity to make bad economic calls and to overregulate. So when all is said and done, I think Shibusawa would have sided with Japanese who bemoan what they call market fundamentalism and its neglect of stakeholders who have been left behind by this march toward a more market-oriented political economy. But I also suspect that Shibusawa Eichi would have agreed with the Nobel Prize winning economic historian Douglas North, who observed that countries that achieve economic development and in ways that work to the betterment of society, ultimately prioritize productive activity over redistribution. And bringing this to the present, I would say that only then will smaller as well as larger firms be able to increase wages, and only then will the government have the tax revenue to pay for social security without raising income tax rates. So I'll leave it at that, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. Wow, that was uh, that was fantastic! Like a tour de force through uh, uh, the, the whole the whole playing field. So it's fantastic. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, Patty. Um, uh, so uh, I think one aspect I would add to this last thing that you just said is that I think if Shibusawa son were here, he would probably give a speech on how it's a responsibility of the business person to make sure that no one is left behind. And that is philanthropy, which is something that Japan has lost completely. And uh, so if you look at some of his readings, um, and, and that's why I mentioned that he was struck by, by the poverty that he thought, I mean, it, Edo was actually a pretty, of course there were poor people in Edo, it was actually a pretty clean and organized city even then. And, um, and, and, and some of the other places that he visited like Shanghai didn't have that in that same way. And that impressed him very much. And so that's why he founded all of these, you know, nonprofits and welfare organizations. And I think he would give a little bit of a lecture on that as well. Uh, so, so that as a footnote to that, Robbie, did you would you want to add something on what would Shibusawa san say about the new form of capitalism? Um, actually, I think it's quite interesting that uh, uh, he uh, uh, had the view uh, of uh, call it, I would call it a more comprehensive view uh, because we uh, think of uh, what we're now calling neoliberalism uh, as leave everything to the market and just let the market do things and then everything will be okay. Okay. But going back for a couple centuries, uh, there have been economic thinkers, uh, including Adam Smith, who says you cannot trust businessmen to do that because they're interested in for themselves. He hated monopolists uh, just the way Shibuya did. And so then the question is, who is going to control the monopolists? And then who controls the controllers? Okay, That is the, hard, the hardest question here. And again, if you go back to uh, Professor Coyle books, Diane, Diane Coyle's book, um, this issue of market failures versus government failures uh, is an absolutely crucial one. And it brings us back to governance, both corporate governance and national governance. Okay? So my sense is that what Shibasawa had in mind uh, is call it uh, a balance of power, you might call it, or um, separation of powers so that they can control each other and prevent each other from going too far. Okay? Uh, in Professor Coyle's book, one of the things she points out is that in precisely the areas that markets fail, those are also the areas where governments fail. And for the same reasons, they don't have adequate information. Uh, there are uh, vested interests inside government that want to do things. Uh, so for example, when we talk about uh, wage increases or better corporate governance, okay, uh, in what sense is it in the interest of corporations to raise wages? Uh, in what uh, sense is it in the interest of uh, corporations to educate their workers? That depends on whether you have a, uh, uh, an open and liquid labor market. It can be very much in your interest to educate workers, even if they couldn't go somewhere else, as long as you can hire people from elsewhere. And so I would say uh, that the emphasis that Prime Minister Kishida put in his essay on what he called off the job training off JT is the phrase that he used, was actually extremely well taken. And he pointed out in that essay, I believe it's OECD data, 
that Japan spends far, far less than either Germany or France or the United States on that so-called off-the-job training. Um, so there are benefits that he was pointing out uh, to reducing uh, the, um, uh, the strictures of lifetime employment and allowing people to move around more. I would also uh, uh, assert uh, that lifetime employment as a system is what I call a jail without walls. And I say this uh, because uh, some of my students at Tokyo University of Science, average age of these students is 40, uh, 43 actually. Okay? And what they tell me is that once you're past 40, your value in the job market goes way down if you come from a, full to, a, a lifetime employment company. And the reason is people are trained in lifetime employment companies to be very inward looking and not go out and bring in new information. Okay? So they have uh, specific skills to the company, but they don't have general skills. And so if they try to move somewhere else, they're not worth as much. Okay? So my sense is that there is actually a, uh, call it not a monopoly, uh, but a, um, a dual labor market where the people who write the rules for labor um, do so in a way that, to protect themselves at the expense of the rest of the labor market. So that's why I think that the, um, why we need another push on uh, call it uh, labor mobility uh, so that people can take technology and move it around. Um, one of the things Shibasawa did so well was to bring in new technology, find people, move them around so that they could maximize the benefits of this technology. And unfortunately, uh, because of the way the rules on labor are written in Japan by the people who, are benefit, uh, who benefit from the current rules, that liquidity of ideas, not just labor, but the liquidity of ideas, I think has gone down. Uh, it, there's also a fairness issue because the guys who are at the, in the lifetime employment jobs get paid more for a given productivity than the guys in other ones. So yeah, I would so actually I, claim that I'm more radical than Patty. I, I always thought that life from employment was a cartel by men, by Japanese men to keep everybody else out of the workforce. But that's mm -hmm. just this footnote. So we, we're getting some questions. So now questions we'll let women in into the cartel too, right? That's right. <laughs> um, well, we'll have to, right? So, so we're getting some interesting questions here. But before we turn to the Q&A and audience, please feel free to write some questions in. Um, I have one, one question for, for us that I'd like to um, discuss. So in his... January 17th speech earlier this year, Prime Minister Kishida introduced um, a new form of capitalism uh, for the first time. And um, he didn't have a flowchart like Robbie just presented. So it was, uh, there was more of a, of a list of things. And then he ended, and I wanna um, uh, quote from this, from this speech because it has a very interesting sentence. And he says, it's very difficult to do this. And then it says, Japan can do it. And that is because it is Japan. Uh, in Japanese, what he said is Nihon naraba dikiru, Nihon dakara dikiru. Right? So, uh, so you could also translate this. I, I like it a little better in the Japanese version. It's like, yeah, we can do it because, uh, you know, precisely because we're, we're Japan. And I was wondering, when I first read it, it caught my eye. And then I thought, I want to engage with this because this is actually a very interesting statement. And so what, what do you say in reaction to that? Uh, Patty, may, may I start cold calling here? You know, Patty's sitting in the first row, so here you go. Uh, you yeah, that is a good question. And it, why did Japan grow so rapidly after World War II? One of the reasons was for a brief time, there was a consensus behind rapid economic growth, where all players seemed to be on board. Everyone was in the same boat going in the same direction for a while. I think the, and I don't wanna be negative about it, but and I think Japan can do it if it can revive a more of a consensus behind it, but I do see big pockets of resistance today. Um, I think it comes from, it will come from equity capital it will come from within the LDP and those who are more supportive of structural reform a la Abenomics. Uh, in particular, I think you're gonna see quite a bit of opposition from the Abe faction inside the LDP. Um, I think in order for Japan to do this, there needs to be a, a careful consideration of how 
implementation will affect administration. I'm aware that there are new panels involved in thinking through different components of new, uh, new form of capitalism that overlap with the jurisdictions of ministries. So it would be a shame if there end up being turf wars over this, but I can see it coming down the pike. Um, and then finally, um, I think this is we're, we're going to see something of a clash of values between the two between the two sides, um, a bit of a culture war. I saw this when I looked at postal privatization several years ago, but proponents of a more free market, hands off state um, political economic model versus the old paternalistic um, risk averse uh, approach to um, to the political economy. And I think they have different supporters, different coalitions behind them. And even though that latter group is getting smaller and smaller, they're pretty tenacious and have vested interests in the Japan of old. So I do think Japan can do it. It is better poised to do it than the United States, given its polarization. It's not able to get much of anything done right now, but it certainly would have to overcome some of these pockets of resistance or the forces of resistance, as Koizumi used to call them. Robbie, do you have a take on this? Uh, yeah, actually I do, if I may, if I can just share one more uh, little screen here. Um, I know it's in here somewhere. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, let me put this up. This is a little uh, thing that I've uh, put together um, to talk about the diffusion of ideas. Why do ideas or technologies diffuse? And I look at it as a four-part um, uh, uh, stage. And what I, th I think Prime Minister Kishida means uh, by Japan is Japan is in the third part here. Basically, a problem comes up as Godzilla is saying, I'm going to destroy the world. Okay? Technology or a new idea comes along. I will save the world with my new oxygen destroyer, as they said in, in, uh, in the Godzilla movie. Then we need somebody to create a national consensus saying, use it. And that's where I think the Meiji Emperor and uh, Empress uh, Shoken did an excellent job of bringing the people in the country together, saying this is the direction we had have to go. Yes, they had a little bit of help uh, from uh, the opium wars and threats to Japan, but at least they could create a consensus of where to go. And then in the end, I've got Churchill up there saying, do it now, because he was very good at crisis management and getting things done. So my sense of what uh, Kishida actually means uh, by we're Japan, we can do it, goes back uh, to this element uh, where Japan has been uh, weak for the last 30 plus years, which is creating that consensus that we have to move now. Okay? Japan is very good at recognizing problems. It's very good at developing technologies and ideas to deal with them, but it hasn't been so good for the last 30 years in creating those consensus, um, uh, uh, creating that consensus. And it hasn't been very good at implementation either, with the exception of the vaccination uh, uh, drive uh, run under Prime Minister Suga with, uh, 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 at that time, the uh, vaccination minister Kono. But you need people like that to get things done. And those are the last two stages where I think um, uh, Prime Minister uh, Kishida is focusing on uh, when he uh, made that statement. So, yeah. Uh, you know, well, what, do you uh, what do you think, Ulrike? What's your view on this? Can Japan so, do it? Yeah, so at first I thought, oh, this, this goes back to the Nihonjin run and the uniquely unique Japanese can do it. But then I engaged in, in this idea and I thought, well, the, the starting point for Japan is different. You mentioned, Patty, you mentioned the United States uh, being so, be, being hurting so much that, that we can't even pass an infrastructure bill, right? And so, um, uh, so, so Japan actually has some ingredients already at its disposal. And as you just said, if it could be united in some way behind this idea, that would be a good thing. So for instance, uh, we know from, from research and you know, Professor Patrick has always pointed this out that, that Japanese have a soft spot for the small green grocer around the corner and they'll buy the cucumber there over the convenience store. Now, maybe that's no longer true, but, the, but that translates into some other things, right? So there's, there, is a, there, there are some, uh, you know, a lot of well-meaning people that have a soft spot for yeah, let's be fair and 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 uh, fair means equal, and, um, and and then there are things like it's still not a really okay to be really rich in Japan. Yeah. And so Shibusawa's <laughs> idea that um, you know flaunting wealth like the Iwasakis did that did not sit well with him, and I think that lives on. So if one could maybe rally some of those sentiments 
of um, uh, on, on a on a societal basis of, of agreement, as you mentioned, I, th I think Japan could do this maybe more easily some, than some other countries. And so, in that sense, uh, it's a there there is a possibility. Yeah, I I, I kind of like that sense. It's a good rallying cry. I think it's, <laughs> a, it's a nice you know get the get the troops mobilized. So we have a question from Jenny, which I think is very important, and so I want to bring this up. Um, and that is that we haven't really talked about the externalities. Uh, she in particular thinks about environmental sustainability. And so, uh, you know, uh, Ravi had your flow chart and it starts with technology and, you know, and then there's more money and then there's more this and that and that. But there is also, um, you know, so if, we, if we're going to put Japan back on the growth path, she writes, uh, mm -hmm. arguably the ma major problem facing Japan and the world is sharing benefits. Uh, by not just you know by not destroying the planet and mm -hmm. is there anything in mm -hmm. uh, Kishida's new form of capitalism that speaks to that? Yes, there is. Uh, he spends an entire section of the essay, the eighth section of the essay, talking about uh, environmental uh, problems. Uh, this is one of the areas where he looks forward to massive investments. Uh, and in the end, this will make energy cheaper in Japan and more secure. Japan today uh, imports something like, well, today's oil price is probably four, maybe four and a half percent of GDP in oil, or excuse me, in, in external energy, okay? Um, if we could build uh, some of these very cheap uh, wind and solar, uh, et cetera, uh, facilities inside Japan, and it is doable, particularly with offshore floating wind, if we could do that, we would have cheaper energy and more secure energy as well. So it's um, uh, killing two birds with one stone. So I think um, uh, the um, uh, uh, cheaper, more sustainable energy. So uh, three birds actually with one stone. Uh, so I think that is definitely part of the program. It's also the easiest one to do uh, because the technology is there already. We just have to uh, move faster uh, and then uh, get some of the utilities on board uh, so that they can see their own futures in those new in those new technologies. So I think it's possible, but it needs a lot more push behind it. It's also some sort of the version of the sampo yosh, right? So this is mm -hmm. what's good for the buyer, it's good for the seller, and good for society. Um, mm -hmm. If 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 businesses around the world, by the way, could get mm -hmm. their heads around the fact that if they stop polluting they all actually win and society will win uh and uh, you know that that would be nice right so so that's really the core i think of the whole shibu Saba idea how can we how can we bring ethics back into capitalism patty any thoughts thoughts on on the externalities question well i think um uh, robbie nailed that answer to the uh the importance of the environmental component in the new form of capitalism um, and just apropos of your most recent comment there, Ulrike, you and I have spoken about this in person several times, and that is um, trying to incentivize economies to have a long-term rather than a short-term perspective. And climate change, demographic change, these are these kinds of slow-moving structural changes that really transform society, but they do them, and economies, but it does so so slowly that they don't become immediate political issues. You don't vote on climate change very often. And um, I think one of the keys to new capitalism, just reading between the lines, is to try to put Japan more on a long-term time horizon, to think in terms of the future and to develop incentives to think in the future. And that would affect not just those negative externalities to the environment, which is key, obviously, but also to our thoughts about redistribution and, and growth. I think we need to be thinking long term. Um, and I think there seems to be in that plan, um, as it's unfolding, elements to promote just that. Wow, that was uh, perfect. Uh, also, I'm looking at the clock. It was actually a perfect ending statement of, of this event. So um, everybody, we, we close at an hour here. So unfortunately, time is up. However, if you put in a question and we didn't get to read it, we will review it and I will share it with the panelists so that they know what you asked. And there's some really good questions in the in the Q&A here. Um, uh, uh, Robbie, can you can you please read out the, the authors of the three books sure. that you mentioned? Actually, let me just uh, share screen again on that. Let me go to the next slide down. Uh, here we are. Uh, these are the books uh, that I mentioned. Whoops, uh, got to go back here. Yeah, that's good. This that's is good. Uh, Calestus Juma, 
Innovation and Its Enemies, uh, Mark Zachary Taylor, The Politics of Innovation, and Diane Coyle, Markets, State, and People. So those are the three books that I mentioned. Good enough. Terrific. Thank you very much. And so everybody, thank you for joining us today. And Patty and Robbie, it's so great to do this with long-term friends and colleagues. So how much fun. This was terrific. Thank you. And, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, really great. So next up in two weeks, we have, we're going to discuss women and why it is that Japan fares so poorly in comparison when the life of uh, women, working women in Japan is not really that much worse than in some other places pretty bad everywhere. So uh, let's review that in two weeks from now. And I hope you can join us for that. Thank you, everybody. And uh, stay safe and enjoy your spring break. <laughs>